Coming up on Dialogue Weekend. 2021 marks the eighth anniversary of the inception of the Belt and Road Initiative. Eight years on, what benefits can we see from this worldwide infrastructure project? The U.S. Trade Representative and Commerce Secretary are on a multi-country tour through Asia. Can the TRIPS course correct economic ties between the U.S. and the region? And this week's Newsmaker, now on Dialogue Weekend. Welcome to this edition of Dialogue Weekend. I'm Li Chou Yuan. In the fall of 2013, while on visit to Kazakhstan and Indonesia, Chinese President Xi Jinping unveiled a plan to build the Silk Road Economic Belt and the 21st Century Maritime Silk Road, otherwise known as the Belt and Road Initiative. Eight years on, how is the project progressing? And how has it helped all those involved? And what obstacles have been overcome during the construction? To review the past eight, eight years of BRI, I'm now glad to be joined by Professor Zhang Gong from the University of International Business and Economic, and Ms. Helga Tsap LaRouche, founder and president of the Schiller Institute. Great to see you both. Why don't I start with Professor Gong first? Explain to us some context here in why China proposed this, building this new Silk Road in the very beginning, right? And also why the president announced it while traveling abroad and also Eight years on, eight years into this project, where are we right now as far as its construction? Hi, Chou Yuan. Uh, nice to have me here. It's a long question, but uh, let me first start by saying what the Belt, uh, and, and, and Belt and Road Initiative is not. It is not a geopolitical play. It's not a, uh, a geostrategic play. It's not intended to seek a sphere of influence. It's mostly an economic play. I think the, the, the reason, there are several reasons why uh, China started this initiative. I think the, the, the broader context is that this is a time when uh, Chinese companies started started to expand overseas, uh, started to uh, build a global supply chain. Um, and, and, and in this, in this course, uh, Chinese companies quickly started to discover that the markets they're mostly active in, uh, these are the developing countries, the third world countries, they are handicapped by the basic infrastructures for things like the railway, the port facilities, uh, the uh, uh, electricity network, the telecom network, all of these things are lacking for the Chinese companies to, 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 to operate properly in these markets. And, and there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, you know, there's some mutual benefits in developing these countries' basic infrastructure. And this is also the time when you know, there's a, there was an access capacity uh, in the basic building materials uh, mostly used for infrastructure build-outs for things like cement, steel, those things. I mean, we're talking about a time in 2013, uh, 2012. Um, so, and, and also, I, th I would also mention that this is also a time when China's foreign exchange reserve was at all-time high, and we would like to see the foreign exchange reserve, you know, close to four trillion dollars at a time, mostly sitting in the United States buying, you know, America government's treasury bills and bonds. So all these reasons combined contribute to the very natural evolution of using that money, using the access capacity, and using the capabilities of Chinese companies of building infrastructures to help those developing countries to develop these projects. And I think this is the broader context. It works for both ways, uh, and it works uh, in particular uh, in a way to benefit uh, the host countries where Chinese companies are operating and these infrastructure projects are taking place. Helga, let me get your take on this. How do you evaluate the progress being made in the past eight years regarding to this initiative? Well, I think it's the most impressive uh, infrastructure project in the history of all of mankind. And, you know, China has for the first time given the developing countries the chance to overcome poverty and underdevelopment. And, you know, if you look at the progress, I mean, yeah, there's now um, the China-Laos high-speed rail project, which is fantastic. It will be extended to Thailand and beyond. And soon, the previously not so developed country like Laos will have a high-speed rail system, which Europe and the United States can only dream of. Then you have the CPEC uh, treaty, the middle corridor, all these projects um, in Central Asia. Uh, all these investments in Africa. So I think it has brought an incredible shift in the strategic situation by overcoming underdevelopment for the first time for all of these countries. So I think it's, uh, despite all the opposition, it's a great success. 
But now, after all of China's investments in Africa, we、well, once again are hearing criticism or accusations of China setting so-called debt traps for those countries participating in the BRI. Right? This is the most frequent criticism we've been heard about、uh, this initiative. So, Professor Gong, talk to us about it. Beijing has made it clear that this initiative is by no means a debt trap. But what has been done by China to support its claim? Well, well, we have to go back to the origin of this so-called debt trap theory.、Mm -hmm. I think it originated in India、uh, with respect to, in particular, that port project in、uh, Sri Lanka.、Um, and it, this this idea is basically a conspiracy theory. I mean, it's the idea is that、uh, Chinese companies go in,、uh, lending money uh, to the uh, uh, to a host country's company,、uh, the operator of infrastructure, with the idea that eventually it will go bankrupt. And and the idea is to you know. Take advantage of this opportunity, and to、uh, swap debt for equity uh, uh, investment. And, and and if you think about this, you know how can a company、uh, go into a,、um, a a project of that kind of a scale with the idea that eventually will go bankrupt? I mean, this is totally based on a conspiracy theory, and and it would be a crazy idea to to think of that way. And in addition,、uh, you know there are several empirical studies out there to illustrate that overall. The Belt and Road、uh, Initiative projects、uh, don't end up in bankruptcy. Don't end up Chinese companies eventually take over as a as an equity、uh, holder,、um, and and majority of the projects are doing fine. And、uh, so I think、um, this idea of that trap is is a far fetched imagination, totally based on conspiracy theory,、um, and and I'll just shrug it off as just nonsense. You know,、uh, empirical uh, uh, evidence just doesn't support that. And now we've seen the pandemic, COVID-19, causing massive disruptions and damage to economic activities all around the world, including the global supply chain, such as thousands of containers sitting on the Los Angeles docks waiting for truckers and warehouse personnel to transport and deliver goods. It would seem that the world desperately needs an economic boost now more than ever. But Helga, do you see the BRI be it? You know, providing greater opportunities for cooperation for countries involved. Could they benefit from a smooth Smoother and more efficient global trade infrastructure. Oh yes, I mean you have already、uh, all the countries of Asia, many in Africa, even of Europe. You have Portugal, Italy, Spain, Greece, the 16 plus one East European countries who all are absolutely on board of the BRI. But I think some of the so-called advanced countries like Germany, they would benefit. The most, if they would stop thinking in terms of geopolitical、um, prejudices, because, for example, if they would join hands with China right now in the development of Afghanistan, which suffers the worst humanitarian crisis on the planet, and urgently needs to be integrated into the Belt and Road Initiative if it wants to ever have stability, so Germany, for example, is very concerned about the refugee crisis, and rather than building. A wall around the EU outer borders, which is what the EU is is、uh, considering right now, like the old limes in the Roman Empire. I think the European countries and hopefully also the United States join hand, and you know, I mean, they they have a moral obligation because NATO countries were for 20 years in Afghanistan and they left the country in complete shambles. So now to reconstruct Afghanistan. And Haiti, and Syria, and Yemen, and all of these other countries who are in dire condition. If Germany and Europe would help and cooperate with China and the Belt and Road countries to develop Southwest Asia、uh, and Africa, there would be no refugee problem. And I think we need an, a rethinking of this very, very urgently because you know we have a tremendous moment in history. The Western financial system is、uh, not in good shape. You have signs of hyperinflation,、uh, the supply chain, prob、uh, chain problem you mentioned. So I think we need a rethinking, you know. And、uh, the Schiller Institute is doing a lot of conferences and activities to convince the industrialized countries that it would be in their absolute self-interest to cooperate with the BRI and play a positive role in history. Helga, thank you taking、uh, the time talking to us. We appreciate your perspective, Professor Gong. Final question on this part to you. Certainly, great steps, right, have been made on the BRI over the past eight years. But what lessons can we draw from these experiences, and what challenges has the project faced as it reaches out for wider cooperation?
Yeah, well, let me first uh, supplement the, your previous question. You know, Hack actually knows my position on this issue. Um, I wrote a paper uh, several years ago talking about how America can actually benefit from the Belt and Road Initiative. I, the, the article's title is Make America Great Again with Chinese Investment. As a matter of fact, I uh, uh, actually had an opportunity uh, to uh, make a keynote speech at, at a conference organized by Hager, the Shida Institute. Mm -hmm. the, you know, there, there could have been a great opportunities between China and the United States to address the infrastructure problem uh, you have just mentioned. You know, you talk about the supply chain hiccups or, 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 or you know, these clocks at the Los Angeles and Long Beach ports, all of these things can be actually potentially addressed by you know, combining the capabilities of uh, the infrastructure build-outs in China together with uh, investments in the United States. But unfortunately, that's not going to happen. Uh, now, back to your question about uh, lessons in the past. And I think this is a, a perfect example to show that there are opportunities if China and other countries um, would just come together and cooperate and you know, purely think of this as from a economic perspective and setting aside all these, you know, these talks about geostrategic, geopolitical uh, uh, lens, not seeing these things through that lens, I think there could be huge opportunities. I mean, there are tons of countries out there who indeed benefit from these infrastructure investments. So, so I think the biggest lesson is that this is a purely economic play, and there will be uh, mutual benefits uh, deriving from this. Um, and that uh, you know, as long as both sides uh, go into this in a cooperative spirit, uh, it should uh, gener generate uh, benefits for both countries, and as well as the uh, um, you know better exchanges uh, uh, through human to human, people to people exchanges, uh, and also uh, economic benefits as well. So uh, I think uh, you know that's the biggest lesson. And United States could have, I would emphasize again, could have benefited immensely if we go into this with, with a, a, a cooperative spirit. But unfortunately, it's not happening. It could be beneficial for a lot of countries. Now, let's take a look at our second story of the week. U.S. Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo just conducted a four-day Asia tour visiting Japan, Singapore, and Malaysia, and meeting her counterparts in Australia and New Zealand. Now, during her tour, Raimondo said Washington wants to pursue a new economic framework for partners in the Asia-Pacific region. So what is this new economic framework? What will it look like? And what other messages were conveyed during her Asia trip? Well, in this part, I'll be joined by Professor Robert Kelly of the Department of Political Science and Pusan National University, together with Professor John Gone. Good to see you there, Professor Kelly. Let me start with you. First of all, what do you make of this new economic framework that I mentioned in the Asia-Pacific region? What does the U.S. hope this framework will look like, and how do you think these Asian countries are receiving this idea? Right. So I think the big issue for the United States going forward is simply the size of its trade with Asia. I mean, I think this is pretty established now, right? China's rise isn't really going to stop. Um, sort of the center of gravity of the world economy is moving towards Asia. The United States needs deeper relations. The Trump administration turned away from the Trans-Pacific Partnership, of course. And so a lot of the American pivot to Asia in the last five or 10 years has really focused on the military. There's been a lot of focus you know, on the, the rebalancing of the U.S. Navy to Asia. And I think what the Biden people are looking to do is sort of provide a more economic under framework, if you will, so that it's not just about sort of the Marines in, in Australia or sort of, you know, tangling with China about the South China Sea. Instead, it's a more, it's a fuller, more robust turn towards Asia. And Raimondo also stated that this is not about China, right? But Professor Gong, what do you think? How much of it is about countering the influence of China, really? Well, I, I would take what she said was a grain of salt. I mean, it, it seems to be every bit of smacking of uh, the inheritance from uh, Mike Pompeo's uh, uh, the clean network idea. You know, I think the idea is very, very much targeted at China. Um, and I think uh, it's targeting China in two aspects. One is that uh, I think what the, uh, uh, the U.S. government is doing is trying to uh, politicize a purely economic and trade issue, as if you know putting a, a tag of a, a, a liberal democracy container versus authoritarian, so-called authoritarian container. Trade has no ideology in it. Okay, so um, so I think Washington is trying to frame that in terms of a. Uh, 
uh, ideological and, and, and a political context, and that's just not right to me. I think the second objective is is about um, essentially uh, uh, technology uh, decoupling. In, I mean, the idea is that to put more Chinese companies on entity list to prevent China from from innovation and from developing technological capabilities, um, and, and and this is also a. Uh, uh, a Donald Trump administration uh, a policy legacy here. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so, so I think um, you know he, uh, she can she can talk about all she uh, she likes to say about this project that this initiative is, is not. But uh, I think at the end of the day, uh, action speaks for itself. Um, you know there are several uh, trade agreements uh, in the Asian Pacific region. We have the RCEP. We have the CPTPP, uh, to which China has announced to apply. Um, and uh, uh, it, it doesn't make sense to me to start up a new one. Uh, and uh, I think the best strategy for the United States is to come to the CPP, CPTPP negotiation and, and, and join. But I, I, I think at this point, there's a lack of a political climate, a political will, and political capital on the part of the uh, Biden administration to restart the CPTPP discussion here. Speaking of the CPTPP, you know, Armando stated that the U.S. would not be rejoining this trade agreement anytime soon. Professor Kelly, does this mean that the Biden administration is at least partially sticking with the previous trade policy formed under former President Trump? Yes. Um, and I think, the, the, I think there are really sort of two reasons. The first, as I think has been sort of widely and often pointed out on your network, which is that the U.S. and China are beginning to drift. I, I, I don't think really think there's much doubt on that. There's an increasing sort of argument out there for strategic decoupling, sort of reshore, re-onshoring American supply chains, right? And think about sort of Apple, for example, you know, the iPhone is, you know, much constructed in China and a lot of, you know, there's a great deal of focus on bringing that stuff back. I think that's that's the uh, the first thing. And the, the, the second thing is that the Biden administration wants to, like I said before, sort of have like a thicker relationship in Asia that isn't quite so militarized, right? Where the United States actually, um, isn't just sort of like focused on China, right? I'm, I'm, again, sort of the the debate in the United States really has sort of turned on turned on China with with Trump in the last couple of years, and I think the Biden people are trying to sort of avoid the idea that we're sort of sliding directly towards a cold war with China. I think, to be honest, we are, but I think the Biden people are trying to cover that, right? Which is why, as your other guest pointed out, right, we're sort of not really saying it's about China when you know it kind of is, and so I think those are the two. That's, that's sort of the, the, the two big stories. Right. Now, almost at the same time, U.S. Trade Representative Catherine Tai and uh, Sarah Bianchi are also on a nine-day Asia tour covering Japan, South Korea, and India, countries that are playing very important roles in the global supply chain, which has been heavily interrupted after the COVID outbreak. Professor Kelly, to what degree do you think that Tai's visit could ease such a supply crunch? And what do you think she is trying to achieve by visiting these countries? I don't actually think that there's a great deal that can be done by politicians in the short term to impact um, supply chain issues. I think those are really sort of midterm structural issues. For example, the, the sort of the famous lockup in, in, in Long Beach and L.A., a lot of it is due actually to sort of overwhelmed capacity in California. Most of America's Asia trade comes through those two ports. And right now it's just being overwhelmed because people are buying a lot of goods rather than services because they were afraid of COVID. So when that kind of stuff gets worked out, I think a lot of this will go away. I do actually think that a lot of this is transitory. Um, but again, I, you know, that said, I think the larger issue in the background is the strategic one, which is the perception in the United States that we're sliding, we, the Americans, are sliding towards some kind of Cold War or competition with China, and therefore we need to sort of at least bring back onshore some of these, these industries that are considered more strategic. And I think that's really going to be the big debate, just as you pointed out, right? I mean, the, the, there is a continuity between the Trump and the Biden administration. The Biden people have not rolled back the tariffs on China, and we are kind of moving unfortunately in this direction and so yeah i mean that's i think that's what the biden people are, are sort of figuring out right i mean just how far do they want to push this with china how far do we want to decouple or delink and there are other players um on this right at a forum during raimondo's trip australian trade uh, minister also said that ministerial dialogue was needed to consider whether canberra can support china to join the regional pact cptpp i mean japan and australia they're now the currently uh, two big parties that are opposing uh, china entering the trade pact professor gone do you think that they will change their mind
Yeah, well, the, the Morrison administration is the most um, ironic and also, I think, the most bizarre situation here. You know, the, if you look at the trade with China from Australia's perspective, um, the trade with the United States, uh, trade between China and the United States, is of most um, substitutional ratio, uh, nature compared to the China-Australian trade. In other words, sort of, you know, the more Australia is deeply into uh, being antagonistic towards China, the more trade is diverting from Australia away to the United States. So I, 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 it just you know, it baffles me that uh, the Morrison administration uh, would uh, you know, hurt its Australian interests uh, for some political gain, uh, for its personal political gain in Australia. And uh, it it's just doesn't make sense to me. Um, and, and, and certainly, I think his entire career um, currently in this administration is built on the idea that it's getting more and more aligned with the United States uh, in terms of so-called standing up against China. But in reality, in reality uh, it's actually uh, you know, sending, pay, sending checks and checks, millions and hundreds of millions of dollars to Washington. That's, that's the bottom line. Hmm. Let's leave it there for now, and we're going to have a look at this week's newsmaker. Let's talk about these pills. Two years into the pandemic, the world has seen drastic changes, and pharmaceutical companies have been working around the clock to develop drugs to combat the virus, with some making significant progress. So when will these COVID drugs be put into use, and can they put an end to this unprecedented pandemic? In this part, joining me for the discussion is Dr. Mohamed Munir, virologist and lecturer in biomedicine, health and medicine at Lancaster University. And also Professor John Gohn is still with us. Let me start with you, Professor Gohn. Now, multiple pharmaceutical companies have been racing to develop drugs against COVID-19, right? Such as Paxlovid from uh, Pfizer and Monopiravir from Merck and several more more now under clinical trials, but do we know, what, when do you think that we can see these drugs being put into use on a mass scale? Well, that's a more of a medical question. I will leave it to your next speaker to, uh, to address this issue. However, having said that, I would just like to point out that um, there's also some development in China as well. And I think ultimately um, it's a matter of timing, basically. I mean, mm -hmm. how long is it going to take the FDA to uh, approve these drugs? It's also a, a matter of cost. I hope that the, you know, the, 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 the prices um, Pfizer and Merck would offer to the world would be very affordable to a majority of people because ultimately the pandemic is a global issue. You know, it's a global thing. You know, we, we, we either eradicate it or we, we don't. Uh, it, it, it doesn't matter, uh, you know, whether uh, you, you eradicate this in the United States or not. I mean, it, it, it's going to come back if uh, uh, this is not totally eradicated. So, so I think, um, I hope that the, these company executives will think from a global perspective and from a humanity perspective to help lower the cost of diffusion of these drugs to a much, much larger population in the world and that we can do this as fast as we can. So that China is developing its own uh, COVID pills as we speak now. I'm hearing words that Dr. Munir is with us. So glad to have you with us. I have so many questions about these uh, COVID pills. Talk to us about, um, you know, these fighting properties of the COVID uh, drugs. Tell us how do they work? Because we've been hearing reports they can reduce the rates of hospitalization, complications, and fatality. But they work through very different mechanisms, right? These two drugs, one from Pfizer, one from Merck, do they have have equal effectiveness, equal, equal efficacy rate, or can we say that one is more effective than the other? Yeah, well, thank you very much for having me. I think one, one, one thing that I really uh, want to highlight is that these uh, drugs are not new uh, drugs in the medicine. Uh, for example, the Merck's one that we first uh, uh, applied in 2004, influenza virus, and then we applied that one for Ebola and West Nile viruses and uh, other viruses of equine origin as well. Mm -hmm. So these are basically the, the Merck one or the drugs that really make mistake in the virus replication. 
So because of these mistakes, the virus couldn't get the chance to replicate at the level that it wanted to. So therefore, the virus burden onto the body is less and the rest of the, the virus uh, uh, population can be covered by our immune system. In contrast, the the one from the <clears throat> apologies, the one from the uh, from the Pfizer is more onto the protease inhibitor, so it um, uh, knock down one of the enzyme that is required for the virus to replicate. So both have a very high efficacy, but it depends at which time of the uh, course of the disease it is given. It has to be given very early stages of the disease development if we want to see the impact onto the hospitalization and deaths. Doctor, what about the long-term risks about these drugs? Currently, these drugs have been only tested on you know, high risk groups such as elderly people and people with underlying diseases like diabetes, heart diseases. What about their effect on other people? Are there ordinary people? Do we know? Yeah, so that is a very important question. And uh, <clears throat> apologies once again. I think most of the information that we are having uh, about these pills are through the press releases from the pharmaceutical agency. We don't really have the uh, peer-reviewed uh, comprehensive studies data that are available to the scientific community to look on to what the side effects are for how long it has been tested in these really cohorts of people but what we know particularly from the MSD from the Merck one is that it it have a quite long safety profile uh, because it's been tested against many other viruses but for the, really for the very long uh, side effects like say after five years or six years that we don't know because we don't really have the data enough for that. What about pricing mechanism, doctor? Can this drug be affordable for average people? I think one of the beautiful things that came out of these both pharmaceutical, I must appreciate, is that they have now put their technology into the medicine uh, patent pool, which mm -hmm. means that it can be distributed to any of the developing countries who are interested to manufacture locally. And uh, both of pharmaceuticals have already, I think, signed the contract for more than 100 different countries, uh, particularly the low and middle income countries, reaching about 53% of the world population. That is incredible. So um, um, although the raw material required for manufacturing of these drugs are really uh, scarce, there's only so much quantity you can produce. But uh, the good thing is that now everybody in the world, I think, who are interested, they can produce it. And that is really great, as your previous speaker was saying, that mm. it's not the drugs that are discovered is the access to the general population until now everybody would have access to this one there is no use of it and that's a really good thing right Pfizer recently announced this license sharing deal that would allow the pill to be manufactured around the globe and even sold at lower prices in poor countries and Merck is doing the same but Professor Go global manufacturing and distribution is no easy task right what could be some of the problems here Well, um, you know, certainly uh, it's a good thing that uh, these two companies, the leading companies, are sharing the intellectual property rights with the rest of the world. Uh, but I think uh, at the end of the day, it's really the speed and, and, and the actual deployment uh, that really counts. Um, if you look at the, uh, the Pfizer company, it's a hugely, hugely profitable company. Um, and I think uh, the company can afford to sacrifice its profits just a little bit. Uh, to um, make a huge impact on the world, especially at this very critical time. And I, I, we're getting into the uh, winter time in the, in the northern hemisphere, and, and you can see the statistics that uh, uh, the, uh, these, these infections are creeping back, actually. So uh, it's, it's a critical time that uh, the Pfizer uh, could indeed step up and, uh, and make a huge difference here. Just one final remark to you, Dr. Munir. Talk to us about the relationship between vaccine and these drugs. These cannot replace the vaccines, right? But these could be potentially the game changer uh, to end the pandemic. Yeah, well, these are certainly very good uh, addition to the armory against the COVID-19, but these are not the replacement for the vaccine because vaccine mm. prevent people from getting the infection, right. whereas pills and the treatments are the one that prevent somebody once they got the infection. So I think it's always prevention is better than the cure. So we have to uh, carry on uh, with the momentum of vaccination around the world mm -hmm. so that people are not uh, getting at that level of infection right. that they would get otherwise. This could be a turning point. That's all the time we have for now. Thank you very much. We're going to have to leave it there. That does it for this edition of Dialogue Weekend. Thank you so much for watching. Bye for now.